All right, now, the title of my sermon this morning is called Calm Through the Storm. And be perfectly honest with you, this is a lot of, a lot of things have been happening in my life, as, as many of you well know. Um, my life has kind of been turned upside down in general. And there's a lot of things that I've been dealing with, a lot of lessons learned, but also just um, a lot of truths. You can have understanding and knowledge of Scripture. You can know what it means. But it doesn't always become real until you go through certain things in your life. And that's when it really hits home. And that's kind of where it's at with me. I've, I've known, these aren't like some, well, I'm going to be teaching this morning. It's not some profound thing, some, some hidden knowledge that's just, oh man, you need me to, to tell you what I saw in the Bible. No, this is all very elementary um, things in, the, in Scripture, but they're very important because I think we have a tendency as people to get too worked up and anxious and nervous and, and add a lot of unnecessary stress in our lives with decisions than we actually need. And I'm going to cover some areas here where, where and why we don't need to have as much stress as you might think we need to. Now, that is not to understate how important certain decisions may be in your life or how much thought needs to go into them and, and you know, counsel and wisdom and searching scripture and things like that. I'm not saying, you know, there's, it's just to deal with things flippantly. But there's a difference between dealing with things flippantly and, and dealing with them diligently, but there's also a difference between diligence and being super stressed out and, and, and having a lot of anxiety over it and having peace and calm even though it may be a very difficult time. And we can have, and the Bible teaches, we can have peace and calm, but see, it, it's all going to start with where your heart is and, and where your motivation is and what your goal is and what you're trying to do, what your priorities are, are going to determine whether or not you even should be you know, stressed out and concerned or not. And basically, the bottom line is this. If you're doing what God wants you to do, there's no reason to be stressed. If you're walking just outside of his will and you just want to do your own thing, then I can't say you don't have any reason not to be stressed out. But let's look at this scripture we read in Matthew 6, kind of near the, the end of the passage, verse number 19. These are, these are, this is Jesus Christ preaching here in, in Matthew chapter 6. It continues from chapter 5, continues on to chapter 7. It's a really long segment of Jesus Christ just, just teaching these great truths. And in verse number 19, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Now, this is very simple, very elementary, but... This is something that we deal with probably on a da daily basis. The world's going to tell you that this life is all about making money, having things, having the toys, having the, 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 the extra you know, vacation houses and cars and boats and just whatever you could get. That if, you're, if the world's going to look at someone, they're very successful if they have a lot of money, right? They've laid up a lot of treasures for themselves. They're a success story. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. He's saying, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to do it. You don't have to worry about laying up all these treasures on earth. That's, that's not why we're here. That's not what we're living for. It's not just to make a bunch of money, store it up, and just stockpile and just live a life of ease. That is not the way that, that God has ordained for us to be living on this earth. He says, you know, moth and rust corrupt it. Thieves break through and steal it says, lay up for yourself, verse number 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I was talking about your heart being right. Because if your heart's just set on the money and the things of this world, your, your, your focus on riches that are ultimately just going to be burned up and, and destroyed anyways. People could steal them. It's much, more, it's much wiser to, to focus on treasures that have eternal value, treasures laid up for yourselves in heaven. Now, this isn't just an allegory. This is real. God, God is going to 
reward every believer at the judgment seat of Christ for the things that you've done in your body on this earth. The work that you've done here, you will be rewarded for. It's, it's, it's not just symbolism. It's for real. There's, there's real rewards in heaven that you will receive based on your works here. Now, salvation, getting to heaven is not based on our works whatsoever. It's a free gift. It's bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You just have to receive it for free. But your rewards in heaven, those are worked for. Those are earned. Those are merited. The works that you do for God, the sacrifices that you make, the things that you do for him, he will pay you for. And praise God for that. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. Verse number 22. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. He's saying you can't have... One foot in the world and one foot in church. You know, we can't have, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't be, you know, focused on just accumulating all these riches and at the same time wanting to be a minister for the Lord and want to serve God. You can't have it both ways. You have to go one way or the other. You're either going to serve God or you're just going to serve money. And that's what mammon is. It's just, just money. It's, it's a goods of this world. Verse number 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. So he's going on now to explain that right after he got done saying, hey, you can't serve God and mammon. He said, well, what am I supposed to do? We serve God. But then the very next thing you're going to be thinking of, well, if, I just, if, if I'm not worried about money and I'm going to serve God, then I mean, I need to eat. I need to clothe myself. I need, you know, I need, I need things. How am I going to survive? How am I going to get things done? How, how can I provide? What, what am I going to do? I need things. Well, no, if you decide to serve God, God will take care of you. He says, you don't, have to, you don't even have to take thought. And, you know, honestly, these are the things that should probably, probably, that would probably stress us out the most is, I need to put food on the table. I need to, I need to have clothing. Now, we're blessed in America anyways that this isn't even that much of a concern on people's minds. What's more common is, oh, I need the new phone. Oh, I need, you know, whatever gadget, whatever toy, and, and that becomes your need. That's what I really need. The Bible's teaching us here that our life is more than meat, than this food and clothing. How much more, if it's more than just food and clothing, how much more all these other things, all the other gadgets, all the other toys? I just say it's a very powerful scripture, verse number 25. Therefore, I'm saying you take no thought for your life. So don't even worry about it. No need to worry about it. No need to, to get upset and concerned and stressed and anxious. Take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat in the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. And I was going to give an example here of, of another of God's creations, of just the birds. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He's saying they don't go out and plow a field and reap that field and store it up in barns and just make sure they're all taken care of. God takes care of them. God provides for them. So aren't you better than birds? We can have the faith to know that God will take care of us. God created us. God knows what our needs are, but God wants us to do certain things with our life. He wants us to live a certain way, and he doesn't want us being distracted with the riches of this world. Verse number 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He's explaining now a similar thing. Flowers, lilies. He's saying they look beautiful. He said even Sol Solomon was the richest king to have ever lived at that time. He, was, he had more riches than anybody. He had all the wealth of the world, so to speak. He had, he had anything that he wanted, anything he set his eyes on, he could have. And even with that amount of wealth, 
the Bible, Jesus is saying he still wasn't dressed as nice as a lily. God provided. We don't need to worry about it. Verse number 30, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Just, just think about the, the amount of stress and just anxiety that comes along with, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What am I going to do? I, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I have all these problems. So don't even take thought. Don't worry about it. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But, and this is key, verse number 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. There is a condition for God taking care of you, for you not having to worry. There's a condition for you to not have to take thought about what am I going to eat, to not having to take thought of what am I going to wear, what am I going to drink. You don't have to think about these things when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You, see, you say, well, I see a lot of people out there, you know, they, are, they do have to be concerned about what they're going to eat. They're really poor, they, you know, they, they don't have anything to eat, and, they're, and, they're, and it's a concern for them. Well, the Bible says that in, um, I forget the reference. The Bible says, you know, I've been, old, I've been young and now I'm old, and I have yet to see a righteous uh, begging bread. And I, and, I, and I misquoted that. It's not the exact quote. But again, the condition there was being righteous, was, was seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Verse number 34 says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So you don't need to be, be caught up and worried about, oh man, I don't even, you know, today's bad enough. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And you get so bogged down with just fretting and worrying over all this stuff. He says, look, each day has its own problems. Just worry about what you've got going on today. You don't even need to take thought for tomorrow. If you're seeking God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. It's important sometimes to take a step back and just put everything in perspective. What is your life about? Why, why are you here? Why do you exist day after day? What, what is it that you have? What, in your own mind, your own goals, your own thoughts, what, do you, what, do you, what matters to you? What do you care about? What are you working for? What do you get up for every day of your life? What is your focus? What's your goal? If you really examine closely, you might find that a lot of those goals end up being vain and meaningless in the end. No one's going to care 50 years, 100 years from now, how much money you had, what type of business you made, what type of house you live in type of vehicles you have, that stuff isn't going to matter. What are you doing with your time? Our time is short. How are you spending your time? And I'll tell you what, there's serving the Lord, seeking first the kingdom of God, it's work. I mean, every, everything's work. But doesn't it just make sense to work for something that has lasting value, something that's going to go on into eternity? as opposed to just being burnt up with the rest of this world. Look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to see a story here of uh, Martha. Martha was very concerned about things and real focused on, on getting things done. And I'm not saying this is a bad attribute to have, someone who's, who's working hard and, and trying to serve other people and, and help, but, but this is where her priorities were a little mixed up. Let's, let's start reading in verse number 38. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. 
And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And this is an important story because Jesus ends up correcting Martha here. Mar now look, I think we could all sympathize with Martha. Martha's try she has guests in her house. She's trying to serve. She's trying to be a blessing to them, trying to, you know, get them whatever they need, you know, get them some drinks, get them some food, whatever she's doing, right? She's, she's cumbered about all these different things. Oh man, I got to get all this stuff in place. We've got people over. We've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And fretting all, all the stuff. But see, this wasn't just any guest. This was Jesus Christ in her house. And I'm not saying there's not a time to be concerned about being hospitable to your guests and treating them well and, and working hard and doing things for your guests. But what happened here is that Jesus came and Jesus was teaching. Jesus was, was speaking and gave his words. And Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet because she wanted to hear because that's way more important than all the other little things. You know what? Sometimes those little things just have to be pushed to the side. When Jesus is there and when Jesus is speaking, it's time to just put away everything else. It's time to just put away the chores, put away the work, put away all the other, you know, more menial tasks and say, no, now I'm just going to listen to Jesus. Now I'm just going to get some instruction. Now I'm going to receive from him. And when Jesus answered, because Mar Martha's just like, hey, look, she's leaving me to do all this work by myself. Jesus, can you tell her to come help me? And he says, no. He said, Martha, you know, you're, care, you're very careful. You, know, you care about a lot of things. You're troubled about many things. She's, she's concerned about this. She's stressed out. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Those other things, it, meaning those other things weren't really needful. What was needful was to listen and to learn, to be instructed from Jesus. Now, there's a time for every purpose, the Bible says. There's a time for everything. There's a time to do the work. There's a time for, as a man, for me to go out and, and work to be able to provide for my family, even though I'm seeking the kingdom of God first. There's a time to do all these things, but we need to make sure our priorities are right and be able to identify the situations, especially, and identify here, Jesus is teaching Martha, it's time for you to come and listen too. Come sit next to your sister and learn from Jesus. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We saw from Matthew that if we're, if we're serving the Lord... If we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we don't have to worry. We don't have to stress. We don't have to fret over all of the little things, all of our needs, our true needs. We don't have to worry about those things. God will take care of us. We see even Jesus himself, when he's, when he's the one coming in to a house saying, Martha, you don't have to worry about that stuff. I'm here. I'm teaching. Just listen to me first. Just listen. Receive instruction. In Philippians chapter 4, we're going to see a passage here. We're going to start reading in verse number 4. The Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. It means you don't, you don't have to be, be careful, right? Be, be cautious. Be, be um, exerting a lot of care. Be careful for nothing. But in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So what are you doing here? When you, why can you be careful for nothing? Because you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You're seeking first the kingdom of heaven. By everything that you're doing, you're seeking by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you're letting your requests be made known unto God. When we could go to God with everything, we don't need to be concerned about the outcome because we know that he hears us 
Verse number seven says, and the peace of God, the peace that you receive, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We can go to our Savior. We can go to Jesus Christ with our concerns in everything. And when we so do, we don't have to be careful for anything because we're seeking him first and we know that God will help lead us. We have confidence. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. I'm going to read for you from 1 John chapter 5. You're turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Jesus Christ said, Ask and you shall receive. Now, the key to getting your prayers answered, we see one of the, one of the keys here in, in 1 John 5, 14 says, that if we ask anything according to his will, if we're asking things of God that we know is God's will, that's things God wants, that God wants us to do, then he's going to hear us. And we know that whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Those are promises that are made to us. If we're asking, now, if we're asking things that aren't according to God's will, like we're just asking for a bunch of money to just consume on our lusts and, and whatever, God's not going to answer that. He's not going to hear that prayer. But if we're asking for things that pertain to the kingdom of God, that pertain to, to serving the Lord, he definitely will hear that. You say, well, what are you talking about? This is one of the reasons why I have peace in doing what I'm doing. We were talking about this before service. I'm moving in like two weeks. I don't have a job. I don't have a house. I still know exactly where the church is going to meet, that the new church is going to be starting up. But you know what? I'm, I, am, I have peace. I'm not worried about it. And, and I'm not saying any of these things to try to brag or show off or anything about I'm just trying to explain why. Why do I have a peace? Why is it that I can be so completely turned upside down? I was laid off from my job in February. But the reason why, and see, God proves himself true over and over and over again. And I'm not some super wealthy person and just have all this stuff. But you know what? God has blessed along the way and, and, and has made so many different things. I can look back now. I'm not going to go into any of my, my personal details on this. I can with you later after service. But it's amazing how when I had a need, all of the needs are being met from various sources. All of those needs are being met. Things that were actually a burden on me years ago have now turned out to be a blessing. Things that, that I didn't, under, you know, like, oh man, things are real difficult. It's hard getting through all this stuff. Now it's come around to be like, wow, this is a great blessing. It's gotten me through. I don't have to stress out. Now, is it important for me to find work? Of course, is it is important for me to find a place to live. Sure it is. These are very big, major decisions in my life, but I'm not going to stress out over them. When you get stressed out and anxious, and what, I mean, where does stress really come from? It's going to be, there's going to be an element of fear to that. And we're not supposed to be fearful. The only fear we're supposed to have is the fear of God. The unknown can be scary, but it, we shouldn't let that affect us. We shouldn't let that, we shouldn't be afraid of the unknown. Because if we're doing what we know is right by God, I know God wants me to win souls. I know God wants me to preach his word. I know these are things that the Bible lays out very clearly that God wants to be done. So if I'm going to be asking God to help me to get situated in order to do this work for him, I don't have to worry about it. Even though I can't see into the future, even though this isn't the normally the way that I deal with things as far as making big decisions and planning them out, I like to know a lot more in advance the way everything is happening. It makes me more comfortable that way. But you know what makes me comfortable? Just knowing that, I mean, what's going to happen? What's the worst that can happen? And look, I want you to apply this in your life too. Just you know, what's, if you're focused on serving the Lord, what's really the worst that's going to happen? Do you really think that God's going to 
just let everything be destroyed unless, unless he had a purpose for it. And if he has a purpose for it, then you know what? You're in his will. <laughs> There's sometimes things that we, we can't even see. You know, I'm sure when, when Stephen got martyred in Acts chapter 7, he didn't, he didn't see, he wasn't able to see what, you know, like you, you, if you were to say, oh man, people are picking up rocks and they're, and they're, and they're, they're trying to hurt, hurt me and, you know, kill me. We may not always understand the greater purpose, but there was a greater purpose. He made a big impact on a lot of people's lives. He made a great impact on Saul of Tarsus, who later became, came on, went on to be the, the Apostle Paul. What I'm saying is, regardless, you know, and, and most of what we have to deal with is way short of martyrdom. Okay? That's, like, that's like the most extreme thing that you could ever have possibly happen to you in your entire lifetime would be some, face some type of martyrdom. The vast majority of people don't have to face anything like that. We're facing other struggles, other things, other difficulties that are on a much smaller scale. And you think about that, what's the worst that could happen? I know, I trust, as much as I trust my soul with Jesus Christ and what the Bible says about Christ dying on the cross to pay for my sins, as much as I believe that wholeheartedly and have faith in that, I'm trusting God with my soul that that's true with my whole life, that's what I'm trusting in. As much as I have that faith, I have faith that if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added unto me. I know that I don't have to worry about my children being fed. I don't have to worry about having a place to live. I don't need to worry about having clothing on, my, on myself, on my body. Why? Because, because God's word says so. Because it says this. We, have, we can have confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. Verse number 3, the Bible says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation, tribulation, trials, persecutions, whatever, whatever may be going on that, that's not pleasant in your life, God is there to comfort us, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So we also see here an aspect of being, of course, comforting one another through Christ. And we know that God is a God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our tribulation. And because of that, now we're able to comfort them which are in any trouble. And I'm here, it's one of the reasons why I'm preaching this sermon is because I've, I, in, in our tribulations as a family, I've been comforted by the Lord. And I'm hoping that my comfort now I could transfer to you and I could comfort them which are in any trouble. Anyone else who might be going through a hard time, just know that just as much as I'm being comforted by the Lord, you could be comforted by the Lord too. You can, you can go through hard times and still have peace and still not be worried. You could have a whole whirlwind and tornado going around and around you and everything seems to be flying out of control and you could be in the eye of that storm and just have perfect peace because we could trust in God's word. We could trust that, that God will take care of us even when everything looks like it's going crazy. Turn if you would to chapter 7. You're in 2 Corinthians 1. Flip over to chapter 7. A little bit more encouragement about God being a God of comfort. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 4, the Bible reads, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. 
For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. So he's, he's recounting here when they were come into Macedonia, they're, they're traveling into Macedonia, he says, our flesh didn't have any rest. They're traveling in without, there's all these fightings going on around them. And within, he says, he's being honest, and there's fears. We're kind of afraid. There's all this, all this turmoil going on. Nevertheless, verse number six, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. And you know, this just goes to the point of how important church really is. I preached on this already. I preached on this when I went down to Faithful Word last week. Just the importance of being in church. You know, we're supposed to be in church not only to hear from God's Word, not only to receive instruction, but also to provoke one another unto love and to good works. We're supposed to be there to help to comfort and to edify other people within the church. That's our job. And that's what he's saying here. He says, even though there's all these fightings without and we're kind of scared inside, he says, God comforted us. How did God comfort him? Through another person. One of the ways that God can comfort you is through other people within the church, through other believers. Titus came, and hey, that's a great comfort. Why is that a comfort? Because someone cares about us. Someone's coming to see on our well-being. Someone's coming to help us out and, and help us in our time of need when everything's struggling around us. Here's Titus that comes along, and what a great blessing he is. And he says, not by his coming only, but they also received comfort and consoling through what the information that he brought because he was comforted by other people. So that made him feel even better knowing that, hey, Titus has been comforted by these people. Now he's coming to comfort us and everybody cares about each other and um, is concerned. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, he brought the news that not only does Titus care about him, but there's a whole church of people that are praying for him and care about him. That goes a long way. That helps people through their difficult times just knowing that, hey, there's a church of people behind you that are, that are being fervent and diligently praying for you. We ought to want to be that type of blessing for other people because you know what? It's going to come back upon you. Anyways, turn if you would to Romans chapter 8. Not only do we have the, the comfort from other people, but as, as that passage said in 2 Corinthians 7, that, that God comforted him through Titus, we as New Testament believers also have the comfort of the Holy Ghost, whom Jesus Christ called the Comforter. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. Jesus Christ is talking about the Holy Ghost, about the Comforter being given, and that we don't have to let our hearts be troubled or be afraid because He's giving us His peace. He's giving us His comfort. Now, the key to having that comfort is by walking in the Spirit. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Again, all these things are conditional because when you're walking in the spirit then you have the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the, the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith all these things are fruit of the spirit so when you're walking in the spirit when you're doing what's right by god when you're walking in the will of the lord you have that peace god gives you that peace through the holy ghost the problem is when you're not walking in the Spirit, when you're walking in the flesh and you're making decisions in the flesh and you're getting anxious and worried about things in the flesh, you're not having the faith of God which will bring you that comfort. Romans 8, 28, the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good. See, a lot of people like to just stop the verse right there. All things work together for good for everybody. No, it's not the case. It's not for everyone. All things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. 
Bible says, and this is the love of God, that you keep my commandments. So walking in God's will, doing what God wants us to do, keeping his commandments will keep us in the love of God. And we know that if we are walking in his way, all things will work together for good. It may not seem good in the short term, but we have to have the faith knowing that God's word is true, knowing that all things will work together for good. Just like the story of Joseph in the Bible. The story of Joseph is a great example of this. All things ended up working together for good. Joseph loved God. But Joseph went through a lot of hard times when he was sold into slavery by his own brethren. They were going to kill him. And then instead of killing him, they sold him to be a servant. He goes off to be a servant. God blesses him. Why? Because he's walking the will of the Lord. He's still, he doesn't reject God. He still keeps his faith. God blesses him. What happens? Another bad thing happens. He gets, he gets lied about, falsely accused, and then thrown into prison. It's even worse than being a servant. Now he's in jail. He gains favor with the jail master. He's kind of being, being elevated there. Why? Because he was humble, because he kept his faith, because he kept doing what was right in the sight of the Lord until he finally was released from jail. He had all kinds of wrongs done to him, released from jail, and then God elevated him all the way up to be basically the most powerful person in the land. He was just under Pharaoh in title only. And he brought the good of being able to save people alive because he was walking in the will of the Lord, because he was receiving the, uh, the prophecy of, from God that there was going to be a famine in the land, he was able to prepare for it and save the people of the land. All because he was walking in the will of God. And he couldn't see it at the time, but all of that sequence of events led him to the position he ended up being in. And it would have been at any point, you're like, oh man, you know, I'm falsely in prison. I can't believe this. I'm a slave. You know, what's going on here? And instead of just turning his back on God because he couldn't see the big picture, which a lot of people might be tempted to do, be like, oh yeah, I'm trying to serve God and this is what happens to me. Forget about it. Joseph didn't do that. He saw the, the way through. And in, in the end, all things that happened, all things worked out for good because he loved God. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 4. It's the last place I'll, I'll have you turn. Mark chapter 4. We need to remember God knows our limitations. He knows our weaknesses. Sometimes we get put through the ringer. We think that we can't take anymore. But God knows what we can take. Sometimes we, we don't give ourselves enough credit, I think, for some of the things that you can go through and take. But God knows where our limitation is. He knows what our weaknesses are. But if you're willing, if you're willing in your heart, if your heart is right, if you're seeking for the kingdom of God, he will help you the rest of the way. He will help you to get through. He can make sure that you, you, you can go through those hard times unscathed. You turn to Mark chapter 4, James 4, 7 reads, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Jonathan, go sit down. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If you draw nigh means to get close. You want to get closer to God, you know what? He's going to come close to you. He's going to meet you halfway. He'll see you in the middle. But you need to be getting close to him. You need to be setting your heart upon God. You need to submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. Hey, when the devil comes and attacks, attacks then you could just resist. The Bible says he'll flee from you. It's not going to happen forever. It'll go away. The trials, the tribulations. We could have comfort knowing, hey, I've submitted myself unto God. I may be being attacked right now, but I'm going to resist because God's word says so. I'm going to have that faith. I'm not going to let it bother me. He's going to go away. And I'm just going to keep drawing nigh to God so he could get closer to me. Mark chapter 4, we're going to start reading verse number 35. It's the last place I want you to turn. It's a good example of what I'm trying to illustrate here. Go sit down. Now. Go sit down right now. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. The Bible reads, In the same day, 
when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. So just put yourself in this situation, first of all, just being on a boat in the middle of the sea. And there's a great storm. Waves are going up and down. You're in, you're in this boat. Waves are crashing in over the side, getting onto the boat. You know, there's all, all kinds of turmoil. People hoisting sails or pulling, you know, getting stuff out of the way, throwing gear overboard to lighten the load, you know, whatever may be going on to try to battle this storm. You got this great storm of wind, the waves beat into the ship, and it says the waves beat into the ship so much that it's full. I mean, there's just water just getting in. So you're thinking like, we're going to sink. We're going to drown, right? What, what are we going to do? We're in the middle of this storm. Everything's going crazy around me. Now look at verse number 38. It says, and he, talking about Jesus, was in the hinder part of the, she the ship, asleep on a pillow. Was Jesus worried? Did he, was he stressed out? Did he have anxiety? Did it, did it matter that, that all this stuff was going on, that there's this great storm and all this turmoil? He was asleep. Sleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Like, Don't you care we're going to die? Now, do you really think Jesus didn't care if, if his disciples died? Of course not. Of course he cared. Of course he would care. But you know why he, he wasn't worried about it? Because he knew they weren't going to die. They were working. They were doing the will of the Lord. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So verse number 39, he, 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 he still helps them out. I mean, when you go to Jesus, like they did, he hears you and he helps them. Even though they didn't have to be worried because they're with Jesus, they're right there with him, they don't have to worry about it. He still then answers their prayer. He gets up in verse number 39, says he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Jonathan, go by your mom right now. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So Jesus said, you know, why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? And, you know, you might think it's kind of funny. It's like, well, because we're in the middle of this boat, in the middle of this, in the sea, and the waves have crashed into the boat. What, what do you mean, why are we so fearful? But that's his, that's his question to him. He's kind of rebuking him, saying, why are you so fearful? And we need to take note of this, pay attention to this, because you don't have to be afraid no matter what storm is going on in your life, no matter how bad things may look, no matter how how the outcome may just look completely unwinnable, unattainable. Everything's going to crash. Everything's going to go wrong. Everything looked like it was going wrong in the boat. It was full of water and the storm wasn't letting up. But they didn't have to be afraid. And his question, why are you afraid? You're with me. If you are with Christ in your life, you're walking with Christ because you're following him. You're trying to obey him. You're seeking the kingdom of God. No matter what turmoil, no matter what storm comes in your life, you could be calm. And I'll tell you what, be, having that faith and being able to remain calm is going to help you anyways. Being afraid, being nervous, being full of anxiety, none of those things will help you at all. They'll actually, if anything, they'll only hinder you. They'll cause you to maybe make some poor decisions and make you make decisions that aren't right by God's standard in order to maybe alleviate some of the pain that you're, relieve, you're, you're, you're experiencing in the short term. Because you're getting afraid. You think, oh man, there's, what am I going to do? If I don't do something about this right now, then, you know, then, then I'm going to die. Keeping a cool head, keeping, having comfort, having peace will help you to be able to say, you know what? I'm, still just, I'm just gonna make, I'm just gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna make the right choice. I'm not afraid of making the right choice. I know there's, there's a storm going on around me, but I'm just gonna keep, just, just keeping the course. 
if you're on board with Christ as they were on board, they were on the ship with Christ, if you're going the direction he's going, you may get uncomfortable. The Bible says, yeah, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're doing what's right, you will experience persecution. You will go through these storms. You will have problems. There will be storms. But the closer you are to him, the more calm you can have. We don't need to know what is going to happen every step of the way in order to have peace. You don't have to have all the foreknowledge. We can simply have faith and trust that the Lord will take care of us. That he'll be with us and he'll see us through. And if Jesus is asleep on the pillow, we don't have to worry about it. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The steps of a good man. A good man is one that's, that's following the instruction of the Lord. Again, it's, it, it's not all unconditional. It's up to us to decide if you're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or not. If you do, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing to be afraid of, nothing to fear. You can have the comfort and the faith that God is true to his word and he will see you through no matter how bad the storm may be. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for the comfort that we can receive from your word. God, I pray that you would please just um, bless everyone here this morning. I pray that you please help us all to make the decisions in our life that we'd seek you first, that we would not um, decide to just waste our life serving mammon, but that we would seek the, the kingdom of, of heaven and your righteousness first, dear Lord, and that we know that, that we'll be fine, that we'll be safe no matter what, happens if we if we could just stay close to you it's in jesus name we pray amen